Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, really excited to be part of this conversation. I just wanted to reflect on the conversations that have happened before us. One of the things uh, that really touched me was the conversation that was happening in the beginning of Charcha when four uh, young children were speaking to Rukmini and Vishal. And we saw the the pain that these children have gone through, dislocated from their schools, dislocated from their livelihoods, having lost family members, having lost a sense of mooring with the outside world that they were so familiar with. But what also gave us hope was these children were extremely optimistic about their life and their hopes of, of achieving their dreams. Today, we have with us a group of extremely learned uh, education leaders uh, who can guide us a little bit on how we navigate the way forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has generated an unprecedented global crisis of the kind we've never seen before. If there was one thing we've achieved in the last 20 years, it was access, and now even that is gone. 250 million children have been dislocated from learning for almost 16 months. And, uh, and almost 40% of children, or maybe even more, have had no access to any form of distance education. So today, we're going to chart what is the kind of schooling we want to have when schools do reopen. And today, we have with us an, a very, very interesting group of people. Uh, I wanted to welcome Ashok Kamath, who is currently the chairman of Akshara Foundation, Madhukar Banuri, who is the founder and CEO of Leadership for Equity, Safina Hussain, the founder and executive director of Educate Girls, Sonali Seni, the founder of Soulsar, and my colleague Shavita Sharma Kukreja, who is the co-managing director at Central Square Foundation. Shavita, I wanted to bring you in uh, to, to kick off this session. Tell us a little bit about what, in your view, are some of the top problems that we face as a system as a whole? And, and what do you think, not just as a, as a leader representing Central Square Foundation, but also the entire education ecosystem on how we frame this policy response going forward? Thank, thanks, thanks, Anushup. Uh, uh, very excited to be here. Uh, and this is honestly, like Anushup said, it's not my point of view. Very proud to present a collective point of view that we've arrived in consultation with partner organizations, eminent leaders in this space, including, of course, uh, you know, Ashok, Safina, Sonali, and Madhukar. So full credit to all our partner organizations to come together for the sharing, for the deliberations to arrive at this. I think uh, in summary, what we've realized is that there are three key issues we need to respond to when we think of education from a COVID response lens. First and foremost is the learning loss. And the learning loss is coming not just from the forgotten learning and the missed learning, but there is also a strong component of social, emotional, and mental well-being. And we have to realize that this is the extent of problem that we now need to attempt to solve. The second issue is a threat of likely continuous disruptions. We can all debate whether wave three is happening, will happen or already happened, what the extent of that will be. But I think it's high time we all acknowledge and realize there is no going back to the normal of February 2020. And what the newness of this normal will look like, we do not know. And hence, whatever we design has to, in a way, be resilient enough for potential disruptions. Third, of course, is a very important lens of equity, like uh, Anusup also shared. Uh, while we'd all gotten used to celebrating access to education in India, unfortunately, we've taken some significant back steps in that. Of course, gender has been hit harder. There are certain castes and socioeconomic strata which have struggled. Uh, a very visible form of that was the displacement of migrant labor, uh, more child marriages. But the equity question all of a sudden needs much more respect, needs much more problem solving. Uh, I'll, I'll try and be brief on the 10 recommendations. For everyone's benefit, uh, the report is being released. Uh, my colleague will be sharing it on the chat. Uh, and I'm sure all partner organizations, including us, will be sharing it on the social media handles. But just very briefly, given 
I mean, somewhere we need to give COVID the due respect for the extent of the problem that it has been. And it's gotten so deep that the solution cannot be a band-aid solution. Unless we structurally address some of the fundamental issues that have now got exposed, right? We knew there were certain inherent weaknesses. A lot of them were being worked on. But certain fundamental uh, shifts now have to be institutionalized. Uh, I think the first layer of recommendations that we all collectively came together were to solve for equity when it comes to access, to solve for safety protocols to ensure instruction time can be optimized, and to ensure that when we think of school readiness, the transition from at home digital to no learning in whatever format that might have happened, when the, the coming back to school needs to address for that integration back into school with focus on social emotional. Uh, I think the, the recommendations four, fifth, six, which hopefully everyone's seeing on their screen, and this one specifically, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists, is the need to prioritize foundational learning to ensure that our children are able to learn with understanding, read with understanding, uh, restructuring the curriculum to ensure that we have the time to cover it, right? We cannot go back to the normal of this is what the curriculum is and let's just see how we divide it on learning days. It will have to be prioritized and also identify the learning level of children and then start instruction. In some ways, the grade in which the child is coming back will not be relevant for whatever happens in the the classroom. Uh, the next set of uh, recommendations, recommendations 7 to 10, are specifically on how we engage different stakeholders from teachers, from our coaches, the academic mentors, and also mobilizing community and parents, whether it's in the shape of volunteers or the enabling role we we have actually seen parents and communities play through COVID. And of, uh, the last point uh, is on decentralizing the decision making. It's harder to make a decision on when, say, a large state like an MP or a UP opens schools. But if there are districts where, uh, whether it's infection rate, whether it's vaccination coverage, if those indicators are reassuring, then can that be decentralized? Can the learning solutions of what's being sent to children at home, how Mahala schools are being set up, uh, that will really be a, a, a big part of solving for this learning crisis. Thanks, Anushu. Back to you. Thank you, Shavita, for laying out uh, the roadmap. And I think what struck me was, was one thing you said, that, that we can't really apply a banded solution. So if it's not a banded, then what? So I'm going to move over to our panelists, and I'm going to bring in Safina here. Uh, Safina, before I come to you and your work, one, uh, one of the images, one of the most poignant images of, of the COVID time that has struck in my head and perhaps in others people's head is a photograph that the late uh, Danish Siddiqui took of a migrant laborer with a, with a child on, on his shoulder. And this uh, is, is the image of, of a large number of, of children and parents who've lost their livelihood, who've moved back and forth between schools. And, and, and as I was watching some of your talks and I've been reading some of the things you've written, you've been talking about this dislocation from school. And, and I was hinting at, at, at this when I started, is that if there was one victory we've had as a country in the last couple of decades is that we seem to have solved for access. Now, my question to you is, you've, you've been working on the front lines of, of access to school even before COVID struck. What are some of your observations on what is a the extent of this problem because i don't think people are even cognizant of the extent of the dislocation uh, problem and second uh, is what do you think are ways and means to 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 solve for it given the constraints that we have in a system mm -hmm. thanks um, and uh, <clears throat> and i'm just really grateful to central square foundation to actually put this report together mm -hmm. and uh, really uh, you know so I think what we've really seen is uh, the pandemic has completely upended the access issue, right? So even before the pandemic, I have to say the numbers were still fairly critical. I mean, we still had 4 million girls who were out of school, but like we have seen with other pandemics like the Ebola pandemic, where the out of school girl number tripled, 
right? Uh, this is a situation that's going to get much worse. Uh, our schools haven't opened yet, so we don't know what the extent of that will be. But even in countries where schools have opened, what they're seeing is that even the majority of the kids might be coming back, but there are certain vulnerable groups, um, like you know, kids who have been dis located like girls especially adolescent girls are not making it back to school and the data from other countries is beginning to show that very 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 clearly so i think uh, you know do we uh, will our out of school children population double triple go up 10 times we don't really know but we do know that the vulnerabilities in the system have increased exponentially um so and i think it does so my uh, piece, I think, how do we think about it? I think the simplest way that we can sort of gather around this issue is to say the biggest and the first and the most important success metric of Build Back Better will be that all children come back to school. All right, I'm going to repeat that. That should be the metric all of us follow, regardless of what we're doing. We're saying sabse pehle. Every single child needs to come back to school. And we need to organize and plan around that metric. And the thing is, then you have to break it down because the problem is complex. It's not all children don't look the same. Yes, you've got um, children who are um, migrant children. You've got girls who've gotten married. You've got, you know. So first and foremost, I think let's focus on the children that we did have data for, who were in school children. Right, but we've got to break it down saying, when the pandemic hit and we went into the lockdown, these kids, uh, let's say one of my kids was in the third grade. When schools open, I need to make sure that child comes back into the fifth grade, right? So if there were 10 kids in third grade, when in March the lockdown happened, we need to make sure that those 10 kids are back in grade five right now. So that's just that one layer, right? Where we have to track and track and track. Secondly, then we have to count the new enrollments. And you know, in usual years, you have to count the new enrollment for class one. Yape, you'll have to do class one and class two, uh, right? So there's this new information that you need to gather and make sure you find all of those children, plus the children that may have entered the village. We are finding lots of villages in Rajasthan where the migrants have come back. And even if they're going to travel for work, their kids are staying. So you've got to identify those kids as well. So I think that's another group. The other group that I think is very uh, important, and I really hope that we don't miss the bus on this, is the transition kids. A girl who was, let's say, in the fifth grade last March, she needs to take admission in the seventh grade, which means she's going to have to shift schools from a primary school to an upper primary school. It's gone from like one kilometer away to five or three kilometers away. Right? That's where we will lose the maximum number of children, and especially girls. And that's also the most vulnerable age because this is the age there will be the push for them to get married and to get pregnant. And so that's the whole other target group that we have to monitor, we have to measure, we have to track very, 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 very um, carefully. Uh, and these are also, uh, and the secondary ones, let's say I was in class seven, am I going to come back into class nine? Um, those are really important. And then some, we have to identify the permanently at risk, your COVID orphans. Uh, girls, let's say, who were in the eighth grade, but now should get admission in the 10th, but they're not going to make it. They may not be able to be mainstreamed back. So you'll need to have a plan to bring them back via the alternate education system in some way or form. And I think to, to A, break it down, plan for this, um, we'll really have to take everybody along. Your PRI members, your Sarpanj, your Anganwadi, your parents, your teachers, your entire system. And which is why I said, like, you know, this has to become a success metric. You know, how is each state doing? How is each district doing? How is each school and how, how is each village doing on, on this um, sort of um, um, piece? And then lastly, I think we'll have to bring all of our tools and, you know, from our arsenal for this problem. We all know how to do bridge camps, residential, non-residential, KGBBs. We'll just have to leverage all of them to make sure that every single child that went out of school March, uh, you know, uh, when the lockdown happened, is back and flourishing back in school. Thanks. Thanks, Safina. I, I I think this call to action of all children back in school uh, is is I think uh, very very powerful, and I think we shouldn't forget that as we as we go forward. Uh, and I'm going to come back to you in a second on on something else after I speak to probably uh, Sonali and Ashok is around the emotional impact of, of all of this and, and how do we mitigate uh, all of that. But I'm going to come back to you uh, when we discuss about when schools open, how do we sort of re-engage these, these children. 
Uh, so Nani Ashok, uh, I'm going to come to you. And before I come to you, I'm going to read something uh, aloud, which I read this morning. Some of you might have read a uh, op-ed that Anurag Bihar, who is the CEO of the Azim Premji Foundation, has written in the Mint today. And it's a very interesting op-ed, but I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs. And he says, quote, education is in a state of emergency. So the real outrage is not open schools, it is not to open schools when that can be done safely. And then there is an even bigger outrage lurking in the background, the phenomenon of learning loss. Shockingly, few states seem worried about this massive educational deficit and plans appear afoot to start schools as though it was only a minor break. Uh, let us observe the enormity of over 200 million children having lost 16 months and more of their learning. We cannot ignore this and move on. Not only will it be hard for them to regain what they have lost, but much uh, subsequent learning will be impossible. How can you learn in class six uh, uh, syllabus if you never learned class five syllabus and have forgotten what you learned in class four and three? Uh, that was a long quote, but, but that kind of aptly summarizes. And if you look at some of the data coming out, including that from the Azim Premji Foundation, CSF just read, did a, a small pilot survey we see massive learning losses, uh, including almost half the children in grade two being non-readers. So let's start with Sonali. Sonali, you've been working a lot on the, what I call the in-classroom component, and so does uh, Ashok in, in a few of the states uh, that Akshara works on. Uh, Sonali, is schooling going to remain the same, which means that the structure of school, suppose we, we solve the Safina problem that all children are back to school, and, and that's not a non-trivial problem, but suppose they get back to school, we restart schools, how is schooling going to look very, is it going to look the same, is it going to look differently, is uh, remediation the answer, um, is there a quick fix acceleration pro program, what does it look like, how do we structure curriculum, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Anastup. Um, thank you, CSF, for inviting Natch Foundation for inviting me on this conversation, which is so critical and something that we all, as people in the sector, all the stakeholders should be aware of. Uh, and Anastup, you bring up a very important point that we are all wondering what's going to happen when schools open, whether it's this year or whether it's next year. Uh, and I hope that our answer to what you're saying is that we don't go back to what it was. Uh, the reason being, well, it was a broken system. It, the pandemic just enhanced or just brought out what was broken in a more solid way. And if that's really what we go back to, we are going to, uh, we, we, are, we are never going to be cover, uh, covering these learning classes. We're never going to figure out uh, what, how our foundational literacy numeracy will be achieved or how learning will be achieved for children even high grades. Uh, so first thing, no, we don't want to go back to where we were. And I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, what we, the second question I think you asked me was, is remediation the answer? Um, and, and what kind of solution can we think of? So I think there's a whole restructuring that we have to think of now. And uh, we can't do band-aid solutions anymore. We can't do short-term solutions anymore. We have to restructure the entire way in which we're thinking of the uh, curriculum, the way we think of delivering the curriculum in the classroom, and what are we dealing with really? Uh, I think in Anurag's um, uh, uh, article that there's another there's an example of what he gives. Imagine if the child is in sixth standard, is now going to go in the sixth standard when they come back, hasn't done seventh standard, was already facing a learning loss when he was in fifth standard. Um, we look at the lag that we're dealing with. We're dealing with a three to five year lag. And to say that remediation is going to take care of it at a short term level is not really the answer to it. So the answer to it is rethinking the way our objectives for our objectives are set and rethinking the way we are delivering those objectives does it have to be very hard graded objectives can it be a learning spiral rather than a grade objectives because with all the children anyway the reality is that they work across abilities it's not no children no no classroom will ever be at the same level and to think, therefore, that all objectives will be achieved at the end of grade two, grade three, which is something we're very accustomed to thinking now, I think requires a rethink. The second thing that we need to look at is uh, remediation. What is remediation? Remediation is when you've taught in the classroom, there's a gap, and then you cover that gap. When the children haven't learned at all, where is the question of remediation? What you're looking at is really bridging through an accelerated process. Uh, but the acceleration at the same time should not affect the foundational literacy numeracy skills because that's priority for us. 
so what so prioritizing prioritizing the foundation literacy numeracy outcome no matter which grade the children are in i think we lose this out especially as we cross the third standard fourth standard and we say that okay let's just focus on the subject let's just focus on the topics but we have to remember kids have forgotten how to read kids have forgotten how to do math we have to get them back to that level before we take them forward and this is not a one year process this is not a three month process this is not even a two year process this is a longer process we have to think of this as a three to five year process that will continue uh, to happen each year so for us to be able to cover the lag that we have faced uh, so no short term solutions think of it as a long term rem not remediation think of it as a long term solution which already incorporates all these elements and prioritizing the outcomes is the most to foundation literacy numeracy numeracy is the most critical uh, as immediate decision that we all need to take no thank you um, so dali for warning us that this is not a very short term fix um, i think we need to hear it more and more i think it's begin beginning to become very clear that a 3 month uh, kind of uh, or 6 month whatever uh, worked in the past is not going to work and i think thanks for clarifying that remediation is a word often used and misused in our ecosystem right Uh, you can remediate something if you have learned it in the in the first place uh, i want to bring in ashok here ashok uh, you know uh, i'm a great fan of the work you do across all the states uh, the other side of the coin did we just lose ashok no, no. yes yes ashok uh, you know the the flip side of the student coin is the teacher and and i and i have heard you uh, speak a lot about how you and and also your team members are supporting teachers and a beautiful concept uh, that i read in an article recently about a dual lesson plan so speak to us a little bit that in all of this how do we support uh, teachers to be equipped to deliver in the classroom better and especially when a, a situation um, which uh, you know, our colleague uh, and friend sora banerji who spoke very eloquently in the last panel calls flip flop which is that the schools might open they might again close because we don't know whether there is a third wave or a fourth wave or something else out there uh, and as much as i am worried about children i'm also equally worried about teachers so tell us a little more about uh, teachers of course i'd love to hear your views on on, on children as well but uh, let's start Thanks. with teachers thank you anustup uh, i think i'll go a uh, little beyond teachers as well uh, because i think it's important that we use this opportunity to come up with a problem solving culture i mean we tend to speak a lot but at the end of the day we have to uh, do things uh, on the ground uh, look at the first reactions to covid 19 when many of the private schools and some budget private schools went online the, other than moving conventional classrooms online there's been little or no innovation in teaching or learning so it's just what i was doing in the classroom you know goes online and that doesn't cut the you know master as they say right uh, over the last 16 months i think sonali and uh, safina both have said learning loss has been significant but let me scare you with the number right if you take 250 million children and assign a notional loss of 100 dollars per child it becomes 25 billion dollars which is 175000 crores right uh, you know uh, an entire government was pulled down on a notional loss called the 2g scam right for that kind of money and here we are i'm not advocating for any governments to be pulled down but i'm saying society is not talking enough about this loss you know this is a huge loss uh second behavioral changes right uh, the internet is not the solution to everything children do need the guidance and the hand holding of a teacher so you can't just turn around and say stop for the other it has to be a, a blended approach right and the third thing i think anustup you also said that third law third wave fourth wave uh, i go by you know the advice of uh, a very well known epidemiologist uh, larry brilliant who solved the smallpox problem many years ago and in his own words uh, to an in interview with msnbc last i think last week he said we are nowhere near the end of the pandemic right and the reason is very simple with so many infections worldwide you don't know how frequently things are going to mutate so 
you have a delta variant and i think yesterday i read about another greek alphabet variant that has just come in so this thing we will probably run short of greek alphabets over the next 2 3 years right uh, so we have to devise solutions that go completely post covid i mean it's not in reaction to what covid did to us but because of what covid did to us we have to ensure some kind of future proofing of education for our children so with that perspective at akshara what we did was we said can we attempt a blended learning model you know you look at the nep it talks about uh, uh, you know foundational uh, literacy and numeracy it talks about community engagement it talks about bringing in technology so we said here is a great chance to bring all of that together is can we bring it in and you know if you look at our report that's available on our website on the alternate learning project we did two small pilots where we said that the curriculum is broken up to be delivered in two different ways one with the teacher you know in a regular classroom and one using energized textbooks the diksha platform and content that's available on diksha and these are obviously all uh, approved by state scrts and so on so the classroom is broken into two and we ensure that every child gets access to the teacher for half the week and access to technology for the other half of the week so you know i strongly feel that we would have come to things like this even if there was no covid because of the sheer digital divide that exists and if you are talking equitable education you can't have this inequity running so rampant in our system i've heard numbers as low as 4% and i think the high side i've heard is 30% for access to smartphones in rural india i'd go with the middle ground and say 20% but that means 80% of our children are disadvantaged even in something like this what is the cost we reckon the cost would be 2000 rupees per child per year so in a state like karnataka where let's say you have 5 million kids i'm just using that comes a 1000 crores you multiply a state like karnataka by 30 times to cover small states big states in india that's 30000 crores say i am wrong becomes 50000 crores what's 50000 crores when you're talking about a loss of 175000 crores right that investment helps you keep the education going it helps you uh, ensure that there is no digital divide children are learning i think this is the kind of problem solving we need to get into and do this in a big way no thanks uh, ashok for uh, for scaring us with those numbers because sometimes uh, quantifying a number in a way people understand in a way people can relate to is is important i just wanted to also use this opportunity to bring madhukar madhukar you've been listening to a number of conversations like this including this one right i mean you've got um sonali talking about restructured curriculum you've got ashok talking about blended uh, mode of learning you've got uh, safina uh, talking about access and you work very closely with the government and interestingly at all levels of the government and that's one of the things i'm uh, particularly impressed by the work that lfp does so tell me a little bit about what do you think are the ways in which uh, the government response can be structured so that we actually deliver on these promises because let truth be said that many of these ideas are actually spoken about in many forums this is not the first time we are hearing them uh, so what's your take how do we ensure these uh, actually land uh, on the ground reach the last mile uh, and 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 what's also your take on how we engage all parts of the government because sometimes when you use the word government we we often times uh, think of it as a monolith and it is anything but that no thanks uh, anustoop and uh, csf nach foundation for having me really good to listen to sonali safina and ashok talk about uh, you know their observations um i you know one of the key sayings whenever you go on the ground and then uh, Yeah, in in Maharashtra, when you go and uh, say how's it going, how the program's going, the often response is ki chan we have a slip chalu hai sab we have a slip. Everyone says like it's going on good. Then you add a question, what does good mean? And the first like no one has really like you don't get into the depth of how do you leverage 
number certain observations to actually see so i think to answer your question in simple way some of the things we are learning from the ground is how do you really leverage data monitoring sort of systems to be able to inform everyone right from teachers uh, the middle management uh, that i think lfp works very strongly and closely with and even your top level policy makers right and uh, uh it's not just to inform instruction but i think even as a non profit organizations i think we leverage uh sort of uh, data in all forms right? like let it be in terms of how many i mean ashok had great examples uh, even safina shared about some of the numbers because these are the numbers that actually rile up both non profit organization but how do you ensure that some of this data monitoring sort of structures also help governance in decision making because we are doing things even in the state of maharashtra there are 15 sort of initiatives that have been launched for covid response in education right but if you suddenly get into okay fine this is a, a tv initiative what has been the viewership how many tr what are the trp ratings do we have a integrated sort of a dashboard that talks integrates diksha the television the radio programs and i think all of this combined i think even if it reaches 30% 40 50% of the children who are getting say printed material what is the reach that has been done if not reach can you go a level below how many of them have again you know resubmitted their worksheets and you've given them again how many teachers are going so it's missing right now it's even frustrating because last night yesterday and i'm talking about a live situation right now yesterday the government released a resolution saying 17th august sare schools khol rahe pure maharashtra mein yesterday 10 30 pm they revoked it why because the covid task force in maharashtra felt that they do not have enough data on children getting covid or not getting covid now we have the data there's numerous sort of researches that have been done at 10 30 in the night again if there's political will politicians really want to do it the cm office the education minister the department are all behind it the educators are behind it we have done a lot of massive but because of a lack of data it's safe to not open schools was a decision that was made at 10 30 now you see what i'm talking about like how do you really uh, there's you know peter senge has this take about uh, assumption of the illusion of broken systems you know all of us outside the system always feel that the system is broken but whereas people inside the system always think that it has it is delivering the kind of result that the system is supposed to deliver it's exactly a, uh, what mirroring what what uh, you when you think of systems change people even though you want to want it but there's an element that we don't have enough data to be able to not open schools is perhaps the most silly argument that you know when everyone was ready your schools are ready in fact in the panel also we spoke to the children children were ready to get back to school teachers are ready 81% talking about data scrt launches survey 81% of the parents themselves want to send the children in maharashtra when you have all of this but there's still some element that our health fraternity doesn't agree with. but whatever i think what what i'm trying to say is data and monitoring is perhaps one of the key things to mobilize people at different levels we are seeing a lot of uh, activity both at uh, uh, you know the gram panchayat sarpanch level but i think the key in this and and the topic is school education post covid i really don't think there's going to be a post covid i think there will be covid we need to ensure how do you sort of live with it and ensure we are supporting children throughout but uh, in in my opinion how do you sort of have an integrated approach of data that is informing governance and decision making at different levels right from a teacher to like policy makers and uh, uh to be able to sort of uh, you know uh, support our children better so that for me i think is going to be the key thing uh, going forward thank you madhukar uh, i'm going to bring in the audience questions here i um, urge the audience to put in your questions on the q and a chat box uh, as so that we can pick them up and 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 address it to the panelists there's a very interesting question which says if we are to focus and this is from vaishnavi if we are to focus on different modes of delivery then should for the next few years the end goal also shift and change uh for example moving the focus away from their current systems of boards exams have a new long term overhaul of the end goal to complement ashok you you hinted that we might have just superpose the existing ways of working onto a new mode would you like to take a shot at this and perhaps i could bring in someone else uh, maybe sunali or Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> so i think you know uh, sometimes we have very simplistic answers i mean one answer has been we waive school exams and change evaluation criteria to me that's a cop out right uh we need to do much much better than uh, you know just uh, doing that so i i think that if you really want to be future proof uh because uh 
I think like Madhukar also said, you know, there will be waves and waves of, you know, uh, this kind of uh, disruptions. I think you cannot afford to have children hanging by, you know, a thread. That kind of is very, very uh, flimsy. So uh, we have, this is an opportunity for us to rethink our system completely and bring in the elements of the national education policy. I'm not saying bring in something new. The NEP says FLN, the NEP says community engagement, the NEP says technology. Bring in all of this creatively. I'm not saying the Akshara solution is the only, but the Akshara solution is out there. We have tested some things out of it and it seems to work, right? And I'm sure there are many more creative minds in this country that can come up with other things. I mean, this is a, you know, we are one of the largest startup nations in the world. So can we put the collective might of all of that but come up with multiple things. These are going to require huge systemic changes. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, teacher mindsets have to be changed drastically. Now, it's going to be both painful and fun for the teacher. Painful because they have to change, but fun because this is a great way of actually delivering education. I mean, this, has, this is how we got to position this whole thing well. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, all the solutions that we did at Akshara, we thought what's in it for each of the following groups, the government, for the pedagogy, for the teachers, for the monitoring, for the assessment and for the community. So if you can answer what's in it for me, for each of these groups, I think you have solutions that will make a difference and it will make a difference in a positive way. I'm, I'm bullish about what can happen. Uh, but we need the collective might of all of us. No, thank you for saying that, that you're feeling bullish in spite of all these setbacks. Uh, Sonali, there's a great question from uh, from Shivangi, also builds on something that Ashok hinted at. We are seeing a massive learning loss, uh, she asks. How do we see assessments changing in this scenario? How can we bring in assessments in the form of pretest to assess where children are, uh, are? How can we go ahead? Any uh, thoughts on that? So I'm just going to touch upon the earlier question and then move ahead to this one. Uh, I think more than thinking of, you know, when we think of the end goal, uh, is it's not about what children learn, uh, but it should be about how children are learning, right? If, if our end goal becomes that a child can learn on their own, children can learn on their own. Uh, if we form um, or if we develop curriculum, if we develop pedagogy in a way that children are able to accomplish their own learning goals. And this is, of course, a period that you know it's something that you do over a period of time but if the if the how of that is solved then we don't have to worry about the what of the learning because then children will learn how to do this on their own so the goal shift has to be from the what to the how that's the first thing the second thing you spoke about is assessments right i think assessments need to be very relevant um to what the child is learning uh, in a way that's relevant for themselves again is learning relevant children are not going to come back to school today especially adolescent children if it's not relevant to them at all so therefore the assessments has to be more in relation to what wh how is this relevant in my life how is this going to help me in my life ahead whether it is to learn math to do financial planning as i move ahead or whether it is to learn literature so that i can understand i, mean, I can write a book if i want to right so it's about those higher learning order skills and i and i i know there is a whole um question around the higher learning order skills and higher learning order skills are looked at competitive exam skills unfortunately but that's not the truth high order is when a child can learn on their own uh, can understand where they are in relation to their own learning and the assessments therefore being relevant to that context no thank you so much because uh, assessments are often used and misused in in different contexts but if they're used in the right way I think they can lead us in the right direction. And uh, I guess, can I add? Can I add a little do. bit? Here? Please do. Yeah, please so do you know, uh, the thing is, if you have, if every child has digital access for half the week, for example, you know, we talked about this comprehensive and continuous evaluation for the longest time, right? Now, if the child has access to a digital device, you could actually do this in a, you know, fairly interesting manner with assessments flowing. Can does it, can the, each child does it on the device. And you have in, interesting backend data coming back into the system to say, how can you improve the learning outcomes? So when you give the child digital access, you also open the channel 
for getting assessments flowing continuously during the course of the year. So that's another benefit that I can see. Absolutely. And and it's contingent upon that big if, right? And and that's a great question. I was again going to direct it to you. Aniridha is asking, we know today about the lack of access to connectivity and devices. Should there be a discourse and discussion on how this can possibly become available? And, and this is in the context of also large systems, right, Ashok, when we go to a government and we talk about access, um, when you're on the other side, you're uh, you, you're somebody who is going to actually make these devices available. Uh, I think a lot of people agree, even on the side of the government, that yes, we should increase access. But the question is, what's a feasible and, and a viable way to increase access? Do you have some thoughts? Okay, so uh, I think, uh... You, when you say access, you mean digit access to digital devices. Digital devices, right? yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Right now we're talking about so, access to digital. Yeah. So, so I'm saying there are so many assets around us that we don't leverage. Okay. Uh, number one is Diksha is not leveraged enough. It's a population scale platform that's available. I think we need to use it more and more and more. Right. I know that uh, as of about a month ago, there were 2,300 crore. Uh, sessions on Diksha. But, you know, we have, don't forget, we have 300 million children. So, you know, 2300 crores is really not that big a number, right? I think it has to grow. Number two, I think, is that uh, we may not have it today, but there is definitely a plan of the government to have fiber optic connectivity at the Gram Panchayat level. So, when that happens, you could have hotspots and then Wi Fi, you know, in, in, in the neighborhood there. So, you know, schools can have access to some form of network, not necessarily all the time, but you can. So I think all these assets need to be leveraged and we can we have to see what to do. I think the larger question is going to be what about devices and who's going to provide for it. Right. When we did our pilot, we you know remember I said it costs 2000 rupees per child per year. I mean, uh, that was uh, uh, simply uh, on the assumption that let's say if Anustu is the head of an SHG in the middle of wherever you are and you're servicing you know 250 kids you can create two or three part-time jobs uh, paying 1500 to 1700 rupees a month and that role of that SHG would be just to collect the devices recharge and service them every day and swap between two groups of children right uh, and I'm sure there will be enough uh, impact investors who would be willing to fund that SHG to make that happen. You know, five, six lakhs. And if the state is guaranteeing 2,000 rupees per child per year, it pays for all of that and three livelihoods. So, so you not only keep education running, you create some amount of little livelihoods going as well. So there is all these possibilities. So financial engineering, I think there's a lot of scope and for innovation out there as well. No, thanks. Uh I'll move to uh, Safina, as I promised, to, to on, on socio-emotional learning. And while I move to Safina, I want you all to think about one key message you want to send out to the decision makers in government. I'll come back to all of you after I, uh, uh, I hear back from Safina. One key message that you want to leave uh, the government decision maker with that they can act on. Safina, tell me a little bit about this whole issue of how do we ease children back into school? You know, this morning, uh, this afternoon, when we were listening to these children, they spoke of of really, uh, you know, big things that have happened in their lives. One, a child spoke about losing her father. Another spoke about losing um, her father, losing the job. There's a lot of stress at home, uh, disconnection from uh, a familiar environment. What are some pragmatic steps that you would recommend to ease children back to school? Yeah, uh, no, I think uh, I think what our children are going through is really immense. Um, and and for that, just like I had given the answer for access to say, you know, the first and most important metric will be that all kids get into school. I would say my second and most important metric after the first one needs to be that all kids, all kids want to go to school every day. OK, so I'm going to say the hawa and the scaring of the learning loss. Please keep it in the cupboard for a little while. OK, because I think it's going to be very difficult because all this 
I know that you know Anurag. Uh, I have great respect for him, and Sonali is my deep friend. But I would still say, keep the conversation of learning loss a little bit controlled, because आपका tension बच्चे के ऊपर जाएगा. Teacher और हम सब इतने rush में हो जाएंगे कि बस भैया जल्दी जल्दी उसका learning loss complete करो. अब वो ऐसे ही घबराया हुआ आया है. You know, I have a, a child Nitin who lives in a hut where you have to bend down below your waist to be able to enter his hut. Okay. his mother who uh, is now working as um, labor on a construction site in bangalore hundreds of miles away from her hut he has been picked up by his mamas and he's working in a coal mine 10 year old boy now this year he's going to be 12 years old when he comes back into school he has gone through a whole life journey in that year and a half right and do not open up your agenda of learning loss with him putting that pressure on his head So my submission to me, your second metric, please, has got to be about that every day. I want Nitin when he comes back into school, when you have enrolled him, is that he feels real joy going into school. Every single child wakes up and they're happy to go back into school. Do not make it a place of you know this rushing into into his uh, you know closing his gaps and all the rest of it. Yes, those have to be done, but give a school readiness time. Give that pause period. My chuntu puntus who are in my camp, okay, they'll be in class too, but they don't even know how to hold a pencil. आप सीधा foundation literacy पे मत जाओ उनके साथ. थोड़ा सा थाम लो अपने आप को. Okay. Yeah. So and the more we scare the state and the more we scare the system about this, the less. I mean, the more pressure will come on the children. And what we really want is, like I said, the metric saying that boy needs to wake up and he needs to be excited. कि यार I'm back in school. कितना मजा आएगा. and if we create that glue children are not used to sitting down and paying attention for that long a lot of the younger kids don't even know how to hold a pencil i mean i remember i was calling sonali like she's on my speed dial so like sonali i have these little, little kids in my camp and i am doing abcd for 6 weeks now and would jai nahi raha andar and she said listen you're stupid they need a school readiness curriculum before they even ready to learn and i think to sonali and she gave she showed me this wonderful material and immediately i was like oh my god with them i have to stand with the start with the standing line sleeping line and and way below where i would naturally and and she she guided me and i realized that and that a lot more of our children would leave that so i would just say everybody pause i know it's worrying you but just you know <laughs> take a little bit of a pause around this and um because nitin and children like him are no longer your captive audience he has worked in a coal mine he has earned his own money आप ज्यादा परेशान करोगे ना उसको तो उसको पता है यार मैं पैसे कमा लूंगा चार मैं क्यों इनकी इतनी बुरी बातें सुनू या दे आर नॉट योर कैप्टिव ऑडियंस अनलेस यू क्रिएट एन यू चेंज दैट माइंड सेट टू से आई नीड माई नितिन टू बी सो हैपी टू वॉक इन टू स्कूल एवरी डे यूर गोन टू लूज इट एंड दैट आई थिंक इज द एस ई आर दैट्स द कोर एंड द हार्ट ऑफ द इमोशनल द सोशल वॉट सोन आर यूर सेंग द रेलिवेंसी एंड आई थिंक इट after bringing the back to school that needs to take precedence before the academic the competencies the skills the learning outcomes and everything else that we want him uh, to really do secondly i do want to make a point and i think while everybody is thinking digital and technology i work in gender i work with some of the most poorest children i want to flag this that please be careful as you're designing technology and digital solution the biggest risk i see to inclusion and equity and gender is at tech okay if we don't facebook was created very nice ki are it will be like social connection and all that but it's breaking democracies and the same will be there's a lot of investment going into at tech but it's going to leave our poorest behind and the gap is just going to be so wide we may not be able to cover it in a hundred years that's the risk we see so anybody who's working on that just be really 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 careful in how you're designing make sure you're not designing anything in the digital and the ad tech space without an equity and an inclusion uh, lens because that is truly the biggest fear that i have of where this world and where education will land up so yeah, i'll start there, thank you now here you live and clear so do i take it all children back in school and want to go back to school as your one line if i'm not putting words into your mouth what is all the kids, one line all kids so all kids back in school and all kids enjoy school and want to go to school enjoy Every school day. and want to go to school so what's your line uh, ending line uh, uh, madhukar for 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 all of us who are involved in schools 
No, I think lovely just following Safina would be hard, but I think for me, I think it's just going to be just leveraging the local leadership. I think there is a lot of merit in working along with, uh, you know, Sarpanches, Gram Panchats, people who have a lot of wisdom on the ground. There is great thing to work with policymakers, but how do you leverage the people on the ground and in, in especially in government structures, how do you leverage the middle management, especially the block and cluster level people? No innovation that I can think of in education has ever sustained without these people being on board. So I think leveraging these people so that the panchayat sarpanches they themselves sort of lead because it's it's no more an issue of quality. It's a it's a community issue now. I think to all the points that have been said by panelists. So how do you make this a community issue of reopening schools, ensuring children are back, ensuring that they're learning, not just learning, but also on their working on their well-being. So I feel uh, that is like the biggest, biggest thing for us to do uh, for, from my end. Yeah. So Nadi. Think of the last child in that class. Think of the most vulnerable. Think of that last child in that class before you build any solution. Your solution should not be at the top. It should be at the bottom of the pyramid. That's really my last and only um, focus that all of us should have as we are rebuilding. And Ashok, what would be your message? Uh, mine would be, uh, I think we need a very strong vision. So we need a vision of a systemic change at population scale so that we can future proof education for our children. So that's the one word, one line, uh, you know, answer. And I, I, I go back for inspiration to what Aadhaar did for people in a large way. I mean, today you can transfer money to your Sabziwala on the street cart just by doing Paytm. And, you know, so there is the Aadhaar database that kind of made that happen. So that thinking of saying we can collectively throw out solutions that can reach every last child. And it, like Sonali said, it has to be designed for the last child. Then it will work for the top child as well. So... The last child is where your focus should be. Thank you. I'll end with you, Shavita. Uh, I started with you. And what are your thoughts after hearing all of us? Uh, you know, hard to uh, add after hearing everything that's been so passionately presented and discussed. But uh, I'll end with what I started with. You know, this is an opportunity for us to learn that Band-Aid solutions don't work. And there is a reason they don't work. Please give the impact of children not coming to school for a year and a half. Like Safina highlighted, we don't even know where these kids are now, right? They are actually, uh, they are having to earn a livelihood under duress. Give COVID its due respect. Let's not come under any political or bureaucratic pressure with all due regards to declare victory. Look at how resilient and strong we are. We got the kids back and everyone's back to you know where they needed to be. Uh, there is enough research which shows that we need more than, you know, uh, like for a grade three kid, uh, the learning loss that uh, she has already faced can only be corrected by the time she reaches grade 10, if we do everything correct, right? So take a more forward looking strategy to say that this will take a few years. If we have to, irrespective of which class the child is sitting in, don't go by the grade of the classroom, but the learning level of the child, give it, give it its due. Don't be in a rush to declare victory over COVID. Don't go for band-aid solutions. It has exposed fundamental weaknesses in the system. How do we correct for that? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and, and especially the audience who's joined in uh, in large numbers listening to us. Uh, thank you for those wonderful questions. Thank you, panelists, for those very insightful uh, suggestions and, 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 and really coming from, from the heart. And I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't say that when I entered this conversation, uh, I entered with a, with a heavy heart and a heavy mind, uh, always thinking how hard it would be uh, to solve this crisis. But I can say that I'm living uh, with a lot more hope and, and optimism, however, cautious hope and cautious optimism. And, uh, and like Safina said, uh, let's ensure that all children are back in school. They want to go back to school. They are happy. Um, as Shavita said, let's not fix any banded solutions. And, uh, and, and Ashok uh, and, and Madhukar have been talking about Let's have a vision that that is both forward thinking at one end uh, that we that we are really rebuilding back better and we're not just kind of uh, uh, drag and drop or click and drag the the existing solutions 
and let's involve everybody let's carry the everyone along let's not make this the task of a few and and my favorite one is always think of the last child and always think of the teacher thank you very much uh, and uh, we we look forward to having uh, the next panel uh, please stay on uh, and we learned a lot thank you again thank you thank you thanks for joining everyone bye bye